course synthesis, yes. <laughs> this is the course synthesis. This is wrapping up your entire BH 101 course. Makes me sad. <laughs> Observation, interpretation, application. Now what? <laughs> Relaxation. <laughs> that was awesome. Is context important? Context is like the most important thing. <laughs> so your job now is to put it in a way that you can understand it. In a way that you can understand it for yourself. In a way that you can also understand it to teach others. Okay, so I've, I've given you tools and, and you can use the templates to organize your work. If you want to continue doing that for your next personal study or if you are teaching somewhere or if you're in a small group and you want to propose something uh, or if you want to lead a small group or something, um, you can certainly use this methodology and these templates. Okay? Has it helped you understand the book of Philemon? And in this class, has it helped you understand Titus? Wow, there's still time. <laughs> After class, there's a couple of issues that I'm getting tripped on by the men on a personal level, and I realize I'm having issues on my own filter. The way I'm nice, good. So, well, I wouldn't know. It's good to recognize that. And some of the language he uses, how he always throws in, you know, please do the things to be the right thing to do, the right thing to do, but remember yeah. what I did for you, and that screams manipulation to me. And that screams what my mom used to do, and the whole family dynamic is like, ah. you know, you should do it because it's the right thing, but really you should do it because I'm telling you to, because everything happens because of me. So really, you're not, I'm not giving you a choice. So um, it's hard for me to break that apart when I read it, because I, he, does, he says it, does it twice. Think about it this way. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus said, be forgiving as I am forgiving. Is that the same thing, essentially? Yeah, and I, I, I understand it's my problem, not it's the book's problem, it's the Word of God. It's, it's a good reminder. Mm -hmm. well, so. Well, Paul so, shows throughout that he has the authority to tell, because in church there's authority, I mean, the elders and stuff. Mm -hmm. He's saying, I have the authority, but I'm putting this aside. Right, and that's the way I decided to look at it, but I realized on a personal level when I was trying to write it out. Yeah. I keep, I keep hitting that, I just keep getting annoyed by that. I'm like, well, if you truly believe that, Paul, then just don't say it. <laughs> that's what I, I mean, if I'm you sure. believe it, that's where my brain took the, we don't need to say that. If you believe everything you're saying up to that point, then that sentence isn't necessary. Well, and I had problems with that, that particular verse, too. I had to look it up, and I think it's Thomas Constable was saying that that's a particular type of rhetorical device called a Allowed you to say something you're reluctant to say uh, in a way that's not so threatening, that's more delicate. But I did have a problem too. I'm like, why the heck? It sounded snarky. I'm like, why the hell are you saying that? Snarky. <laughs> 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 and, you know, that's yeah. my 20th, no, my 20th and 21st century brain. Yes. With 20th, 21st century thinking and what do we approach things. Yes. yes. It's overlaid yeah. on that. Yeah. Yes. That's where I've had trouble. But what, what, guess, and the personal experience. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That one scripture that where Paul says, um, my words are so forceful in letter, but when I'm with you, I'm weak. Uh, Second right? Corinthians, yeah. It gives the, the, the picture that when he's with people, he's, he's a very meek, mild-mannered person. So if you knew someone like that, and they were to say it, it would come across different. Ooh, look at the context. You know what I mean? <laughs> So that was really that? good. Was that good? Yeah. That's from 2 Corinthians. That's exactly what he said. Well, yeah, it's actually got a Hebrew that explains the phrase that we're talking about. It's a paralipsis, P-A-R-A-L-E-I-P-S-I-S, which is a way to say something we are reluctant to say in a delicate way. But when I first read that, and I said, you know, why, why did he throw that in there? Because it sounded snarky. And uh, I had to dig further into that. Like you say, kind of understand it back then and why he was doing that. Because in our century, in our in today's culture, to say something that sounds kind of mean. Or yes. Or it, it, like you say, it sounds manipulative. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
because we uh, doing that. Go ahead. Or recognized, and then saying, I'm trying to put it in my context when it's really in that context. And honestly, Melissa, that was brilliant. Because if, if they know Paul, then they know how meek he is. And so for him to do that, it wouldn't be like, oh, there goes, because we all, I mean, I've had people like that too. <laughs> we've, we've all had that person that does that. Yeah. Of course. Oh, yeah. It's all over verses 4 to 7. He says, Paul was one of those regal natures to which things are possible that other men dare not do. No suspicion of weakness attaches to him where he pours out his heart in love, nor any of insincerity where he speaks of his continual prayers for his friends, or when he runs over in praise of his converts. Few men have been able to talk so much of their love without betraying its shallowness and self-consciousness or of their prayers without exc exciting a doubt of their manly sincerity. Hmm. The apostle could venture to do these things without being thought either feeble or false, and could unveil his deepest affections and his most secret devotions without provoking a smile or shrug. Wow. Uh, nice analysis. Covered. It wasn't me, but you know, I thought that was really good. Yeah, no, that was, that's a very good find. One thing I thought was really neat, though, too, is he hit it hard, you know, and he, but he, you know, he's, Kind of pulled back a little bit on his authority and stuff. But at the end, he stopped. He cut it and he went on. So yes. like, this is taken care of. He didn't. Yeah. He didn't <laughs> keep hammering him like, yeah, okay, now I want to. I want to follow up and see what you do. He's like, I'm moving on because I know this is taken care of. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. There is an excellent application actually from what you were saying because. When you're saying, like, they know Paul, so when they read his writing, they know of his character, so they have an understanding about what he's saying. But, you know, even in today's society, like, if you send, when we send text messages, emails, and stuff like that, people don't always have those kind of censors about things. So, like, even I could write something, and they'll look at it and be like, I can't believe you are just so offensive to me, and you are being rude, and I'm like... You don't know my nature and my character. If you understand my yes. character, you understand that I'm just pointing some things out to you. I'm not being rude or nothing to you. But that's how people see things, you know what I mean? Like if you get a text message and somebody just happened to have caps on their phone, but it's all in caps, you're like, oh, she's yelling at me. I can't believe it. But that's how our society works. We, we, get, we, we read more into words on paper than what we really ought to. And a lot of times we do have a tendency to think outside the character and the nature of the person. That, yep. That we're and we do have to be careful about that. So that'd be a good application for. That's an excellent application because that happens all the time. All of the time. All the time. Churches break up over stuff like that, over emails. And <laughs> yeah. They do. It's crazy. So for the templates that I gave you, feel free to put it in a format that best suits you. I have given you these as just a, t as a tool for you to use. If you want to do it a different way, please do it a different way. Do it a way that makes the most sense to you. The tools that uh, we developed for these, these templates were to help to take you along that road of observation, interpretation, and then application. Keep your notes. Keep your notes in a way that they will last. If it is written, keep it in a safe place. In fact, if it is written, I'd recommend scanning it in and then saving it on a computer. And then I'd recommend that you use something like Carbonite. Carbonite is what I use to back up all my files. So all my files are saved on this website, Carbonite. And there's... Oh, it's a website. Yeah. I didn't know what Carbonite was. <laughs> yeah. It, Yes, it is a good way to smuggle uh, goods like Han Solo. That was my first thought. I yeah. Was like, Star Wars. It is. It is. Yeah. But Carbonite, <laughs> and there's other things. I, I believe there's OneDrive and the cloud. Save your stuff on the cloud. I think that's a fantastic idea because if your computer it goes kaput, and you never saved it on anything outside of your computer. Or you lose your flash drive. You lose your flash drive. It's gone, baby, gone. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about some practical examples of what you can do once you have all of this stuff together. 
how you can synthesize it, bring it all together, and, and tell other people about it. And this will be just examples of some of the things that I've done. Uh, presentations for groups. Presentations for groups are great. You can have a few pages of notes, like paper in hand, and talk from that. You know, no PowerPoint, nothing. You just have paper in hand with some bullet points from the whatever you studied in, if you ever get a chance to teach. Or if you're teaching one-on-one, -on -one, but let's we'll first start about groups. You can have something on hand, go point by point. You can have questions in there. Just something, you, maybe you wrote it down. Okay, this is just an example of what you can do. You can use a PowerPoint presentation. I like PowerPoint presentations or Prezi or any, any other presentation thing that you want to use. I like these. I especially like them because you all have a copy of them and some of my slides are a bit wordy. They're a bit wordy so that you can see a little more. I don't like just putting up a couple of words and then, then the PowerPoint doesn't really ha give you everything that I want it to. I want it to also give you some notes. So you can, but you can do it however you want. Um, I don't know if you all have heard of Hook, Look, Book, Took. Hook, Look, Book, Took. It does sound like Dr. Seuss. I'll show you um, a way of going about this. But when you're teaching <coughs> in a well, whatever setting that you're teaching in, you can use this method of hook, look, book, took. You start with a hook, something to grab their attention. Maybe you're not in God's Word yet. Maybe there's something from God's Word that they're going to see, and you want to grab their attention about it. And so you start them thinking down that road. And then you take a look, and you read the Bible. And then you hit the book hard. You start explaining what's in the book. And then you give them, the took part is an application to take with them, something that they will have to took. <laughs> it rhymes. Hook, look, book, took. The took being an application. They take away with them. It's a, it's a takeaway. When we teach through a book of the Bible, we employ this type of tactic sometimes, but we always start with a formal introduction. We do a formal introduction and then a verse by verse analysis of the book, just like you've done here. You've done your formal introduction and you could go verse by verse. You have enough information on every single verse in Philemon. <laughs> you could have a, a really good presentation. Uh, now probably uh, like what you have written, you have paragraphs written, just about one verse. I think you had two paragraphs, right? I mean, that'd be a lot to cover if it's one verse and you have two paragraphs. So if for every verse you had two to four paragraphs, that'd be a lot to hit. That's, where, that's what the whole point of those synthesis statements was, to help you boil it down so that when you give a presentation, you don't give everything, and then you need a five-hour window. I can't teach Philemon in 45 minutes. Forget it. I need at least five hours. <laughs> uh, ask them questions. Ask them questions and allow them to ask questions. I love If you're prepared in a book, you shouldn't be afraid for them to ask questions. Like, well, Melissa, what is an apostle? <laughs> okay, you, maybe you have the answer to that. Well, who's Archippus? Archippus. You, oh, I'll tell you who. I'm glad you asked that. I was ready for you. <laughs> um, so you allow them to ask questions. Small group and one-on-one. -on -one, you can use your template. You can use Q&A, question and answer. Uh, if you're going to use question and answer, so I've, I've done a couple of different things in my, the small groups that I've led. I have templates. I'll show you those templates here in a little bit. And I have Q&A, uh, question and answer, where we will go through, and then they'll ask questions, and then we'll answer it. We will answer it together. Um, Right, Jarrett? Absolutely. <laughs> and sometimes it's probably annoying because I don't always want to answer everything. Uh, but let's take a look at these. Oh, yeah, one more thing. You could write books. Erica has written books. Erica has written books. With the information and the knowledge she has, she has written books. You can write books. You could write a little commentary yourself, right? 
You could write papers, articles, whatever. If you're a writer, write. Write. Do it. There's nothing wrong with it. Seek out ways to do it. All right? We need more good people out there who are writing sound doctrine. We don't need another self-help uh, book to live your best life now type thing. We don't need another one of those. We need the truth of God's word and not name it, claim it type of stuff. Make videos. Uh, lots of opportunity in this day and age to make a video. Dylan was talking about the videos that those guys make the Bible Project. I've seen some of those videos. They're really, <laughs> really creative. They do a great job. Uh, we record all of our stuff. You know why we do that? Because we're hoping that NBC will pick us up. <laughs> we're doing that because we've been impacted by people that do that. I've been greatly impacted by R.C. Sprawl and Howard Hendricks and Dawson Trotman and a host of others that have never met me. They've had a massive impact on my life because they're on the radio or they have videos or something of that nature. And NBC could stand for nothing but Christ. Oh, boom! <laughs> nothing, nothing but Christ. And so in the same way, we, and, and YouTube is a great place to put videos because the whole world can look at it. And we've had people outside the U.S. watch our videos on every continent except for Antarctica. I don't know how to break into that market. <laughs> and it's great. It's free. And even in some uh, Egypt, someone in Egypt, somebody in Saudi Arabia was listening to one of our videos. All right, presentations. <clears throat> I've got some slides. Yeah, everybody hates giving presentations, right? Is this how, how many of you feel like this if you had to give a presentation? <laughs> All right, there's a couple. Yeah. Even after teaching for 10 years, I still got nervous. Hmm. I mean, eventually it went away, but it was like that first initial. Yeah, there's always something that I feel like Yeah. I get it. Um, I never feel it anymore. <laughs> the only way I'd feel it is if I wasn't prepared. If I had to teach on something I didn't know anything about, then I probably would calm down and say, well, I don't know much about it, so who else could teach it? <laughs> okay, so here's, here's what I did for First John. Dylan and I guest taught for the fellowship class last year, uh, which meets at, or was meeting at 9.30, and we taught through First John. And so I like to put pictures up, and these are all pictures from John's life. There's Zebedee, his father, and he and his brother James, fishermen. Here he is uh, leaning on Jesus at the Last Supper. Here's Peter and John in the book of Acts, and here's John on the island of Patmos. And I like to talk. This is kind of like a, a hook. I think I've got, I've got a, an example of the hook later, but I'll spend time talking about this to say the life of John and, and, and go in about what each of these pictures means and then we go into the formal introduction. I skipped a bunch of stuff because I, we always hit the context thing and how important context is. But your formal introduction. Hey look, does this look familiar? This is from a, a year ago. <laughs> almost a year ago. Yeah, no. Almost two years ago. Okay, time flies. Um, I mean, did you do John before you did Isaiah? No. Mm -mm. We finished Isaiah a couple years ago. You did John after? This is for the fellowship class. Oh, the fellowship class. Yeah, so we guest teach at other classes. And so, does this look familiar? Who is the author? External evidence. Internal evidence. <laughs> Uh, who is the author? I give a whole lot of evidence. Tell, we we want to learn more about who is this guy. John, you know, I won't go into all of it here. Time and place of writing. Right? Who were the recipients? What's the background setting? False teachers is such an important thing in First John. For you to understand First John, we get into dualism. Um, 
which is the father of Gnostic Gnosticism. So give them background on that. Background on some other people in here. Simon Magus. Corinthus. Hey, I forgot I had this in here. I shared the story about John walking into that bathhouse and saying, let's get out of here. <laughs> uh, which is fun. The Nicolaitans are mentioned. The Nicolaitans from Revelation that nobody knows. Well, nobody knows who the Nicolaitans were. Well, the early church sure did. So what, what do they know? Now we know better. Um, and then, so after I do the... Uh, oh, purpose of the letter. Yeah, purpose. Does that look familiar? This is all formal introduction stuff. Purpose of the letter. And then the next week, I'm, I'm going to take them through the exposition verse by verse of First John. And so... I start out with a hook. My hook was um, what, you know, the idea is walking in the light, okay? But I start out by asking, what is it like when you walk in the dark in an unknown place? And I, I just have this one up there, and I have this dark thing. And then I, maybe I'll act it out a little bit. What if I was walking here? You know, these sorts of things happen. And I said, now, I've, I've got a picture on the next slide of where this is. And you tell me if you want to walk in the dark in that place. And so, okay, so, and the other question is, what is it like when you physically walk in the light anywhere you may walk? So the picture on the next slide, if, would you rather walk in the dark or in the light? Are you all ready? <laughs> the dark. Hook. <laughs> okay. Now I didn't give it to you the same way I gave it to them, but this was used to draw them in. Because there's a real spiritual meaning to walking in the light versus walking in the dark. And if you have to walk <laughs> around in here and you're in the spiritual dark, man, you're toast. So that's the hook. And then we started, we looked, and I, I read, uh, well, the first verse was really important. I spent a lot of time on the first verse. Typically, I will have in black the verses that we're going to read, and it'll be like the first passage, and it comes right off of the outline that I made. <laughs> so we'll read that chunk, and then I'll, I'll tear it apart. But for this one, it was particularly, I had to get into chapter, or verse 1. We spent a lot of time on verse 1, talking about Jesus as the, uh, the word of life and oh, actually this one was pretty deep and then we just handled verse 2 verses 3 through 4 John starts out deep. yeah it starts out pretty deep like tomorrow I think I've got five sections in my outline five major breakdowns for Daniel chapter 6 and they're all decent chunks so uh, but that's that's one method that you could do. You could put together a presentation and put your all the information that you got onto the presentation. And oh yeah, I like to end. Sometimes I'll, I'll do it two different ways. It depends on like yet I was struggling with Daniel six, which I'm going to teach tomorrow. Uh, there were applications that I really wanted to put in each section, but I threw them all at the end. And there's a lot of applications in that one. So here I've got a slide. The whole slide is dedicated to applications from this section of 1 John that I taught through. And uh, here's the, some of the applications. Accept the testimony and authority of the eyewitnesses, the testimony in the Bible. These are eyewitnesses in, in the court of law. He says he's an eyewitness. John says it right there in, in 1 John. So you should, should accept it. And then walk in the light. What does it mean to walk in the light? You accept the gospel of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for the payment of your sin. You know God's word and you do it. These are general. Be in fellowship with other believers. There's a lot in 1 John about loving one another. Uh, quickly admit. Quickly admit and confess all your sins to God. Uh, you can't hide your sin and be in good relationship with God. So this is just, you, you can have tons of applications. But you put 50 applications on a slide, people are going to be, I was good with the second one. I don't remember it now. 
small groups and one-on-one. -on -one. I've used this Bible book study. I, I've used it for years. There's a book preview, which is basically the formal introduction. And then you do a chapter analysis, which is basically all uh, you're asking questions and answering them. So observations and interpretations. Uh, and then the book summary. Once you're finished with the book, what you can do. This is what my mentor gave me. I turned it more into this. This is what our small group used to do. This template here. We do a Bible book, introduction. Who was the writer of the book? Who was the book written to? Does this sound familiar? <laughs> when was the book written? Where was the book written? Why was the book written? What literary genre is this? <laughs> Pretty familiar. Um, so you can implement this in your small group or one-on-one -on -one with somebody. Say, hey, I studied Philemon. I found a lot on it. You wanna, can, I take, can I take you through it? <laughs> maybe you've got somebody in a, that, that you are meeting with, or maybe you want to meet with somebody and see if they want to meet. You're equipped now to take them through Philemon. Uh, explain any controversial issues you found. In the chapter analysis, list some observations and repeated words in the chapter that stand out. Write out questions that you have about the chapter and try to answer them. <laughs> Find some cross-references. Select what you think is the key verse. Outline the chapter in a logical flow. What is the main point that God is trying to get across to the reader? How does this fit in context with the rest of Scripture? What is your personal application from this chapter? I've been doing this. <laughs> uh, it's worked very well. The Q&A is good. You use your knowledge of a book to lead a group or a person through it. And you can ask questions and, or, and, or they can ask questions. You read the passage. They can come up with questions. What are your questions in this? And well, what does that mean? Well, what do you think it means? Well, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. Okay, well, let's think about it. Don't spoon feed them. You know, people have to learn to do this on their own. They have to see, I can, I can actually look at the, what's the context? Hey, uh, Jared, remember Matthew 24? What was happening before that? I'm putting you on the spot. Yep. Yep. What were they trying to do? Were, uh, to him. They were trying to trap him in something. Yep. They were always doing that. Yep. I don't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. Bingo. Every week, we, we go over, okay, where are we at? What was happening before to set up what's happening now? The context. These chapters and verses are a real stumbling block. Sometimes people get hung up on them and they're afraid to look back, or, or they think, "Well, that's has nothing to do with this. See, it's a new chapter. See, <laughs> uh, yeah. Let them try to work through it. Let them them work through it. You got to teach them to walk and teach them to run, and create a discussion atmosphere to stimulate their interest and engagement with the scripture. This is what I'm trying to do. Sorry, Jarrett. This is what I'm trying to do." in my small group right now. The template format I think was a little intimidating for several of them. Several of them were doing it. Several of them were not. So I went from the template format to the Q&A format. This is working well and it's stimulating them to think about these things and to question these things and then they want to pull in all these cross references and it's really interesting because we're hitting the end time stuff and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and we're hitting all these things at once and, and I'm, what I'm hoping, and don't give away any secrets here Jared, I'm hoping that it will, that it will show them that they need to be more serious about writing things down and keeping track of it because from one week to the next the Q&A becomes not so efficient because uh, oh, what was where were they oh yeah where, they were in the temple with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and all that kind of thing this is good though is this working well I like it boom he likes it 
You know, you could be an elder now. <laughs> you could be an elder now. <laughs> uh, writing. You write your own research papers for yourselves. You, you're wondering if predestination, which, what's right, Calvinism or Arminianism? Are you of Calvin or are you of Arminius? Well, I don't know about any of that, but why don't we look at predestination? You think you could research it in Scripture? What about faith and works in James chapter 2? What about losing your salvation in Hebrews chapter 6? Can you lose your salvation? Well, that's cute. It's true. <laughs> but what, what am I going to do? I stumble over Hebrews chapter 6. You can research this stuff yourself, okay? You can do it for yourself or for others. Write a book. You know, maybe the book won't go anywhere. Is it worth it to go through the process? It is. Maybe the book will go somewhere. I don't know. Um, submit articles for publication. If you're a writer, find your whatever your thing is, find your avenue and do it. Maybe you write curriculum. <laughs> write curriculum. Maybe that's your thing. Maybe you dig it. Maybe you like videos. <laughs> hey, videos are so great. You can put videos out on the internet for free. We've got, oh yeah, creative videos, teaching videos, short videos, long videos. We have 204 videos teaching about God. And CBC has a bunch of videos on Vimeo. Ours are on YouTube. More people use YouTube. That's why we picked it. But here's the thing. You have to use any method that works for you in your strengths and in your context. I love teaching. I love small groups. I love meeting one-on-one. -on -one. Okay? I love doing presentations. I'm not going to be tired when I go home today. Oh, that has drained me all day. No, I'm energized. I love it. Some of you are sleepy. I've been there. It's an all-day class. You get a <laughs> punch yourself sometimes. Stay awake, even if you're interested. I love it. But use the, your method, the method that you do. Use it for God's glory, okay? You were tailor-made by God for a purpose. You were gifted. The Holy Spirit did not make a mistake with the gift that you have. He gives to whom He chooses. I can't do what you do. Jared, I can't do what you do. Curtis, I can't do what you do. Melissa, I can't do what you do. Erica, I can't do what you do. John, I can't do what you do. Carol, this may come as a shock to you, <laughs> but I can't do what you do. You were tailor-made, and you have the right gifts and skills. You do. You'll be happy if you employ them. Your life will be fulfilled. You have freedom to use that creativity, whatever it looks like, whether you're creative or if you're a data collector, engineer type. Okay? All right. Let's go back over this so that we're all clear. Put you on a path. It's been a path, <laughs> a certain method, a certain way to get into God's Word so that you can rightly interpret it and apply it. This is what we shot for. The process was observation. What do I see? Interpretation and correlation, looking throughout Scripture, and scholarly writings. What does it mean? And answering, how does this relate to, the, to all of Scripture? Is that Dylan in there saying, freedom? Uh, <laughs> there are no contradictory meanings throughout Scripture. If, if you find one, let me know. We're not done! <laughs> Observation, interpretation, application, answers. How does it work?
This is the process you've, you've gone through. You're going to go through this one. You're going to finish going through this one next. Yeah? It would seem that one thing that would be nice to have is, as a result of this class, a paper that used, it combined all of the process, meaning it went through observation and interpretation and then application and it wrapped it all up. So you had a one document that was the entire book and the, the end result of all of your work was You've got it. Yeah, because it looks like the application assignment is not, not that. It's just the application piece, which is good. You so combine them all into one. one. I mean, you, you can combine them all into one. I mean, just for referencing letters. That's probably why David's was 40. What we had them do last semester is your rough draft was due by the due date. And then the total thing was due at the end of class, like two weeks after class ended. And it was the whole paper. It was all of it combined. That proved to be very difficult for everybody. <laughs> and because we would grade it, send our corrections, people would do corrections, and then they'd spend a whole lot more time. And then they spent way too much time. And they said, don't do that again. Uh, the product is that you become more like Christ in this process. The Bible isn't there to satisfy your curiosity. It is there to transform your life. You got first-hand uh, exposure to the scripture in a different way. I don't know. Have you all walked away looking at scripture in a different way in this process? I hope so. We hope that you've been equipped, encouraged, and edified, uh, and that you're going to apply this in your own life and in your own ministry context, whatever that may be. I like the page 317 in Living by the Book. There's a nice chart. Um, you can look at it if you'd like. The, the, the point is this. God's Word can transform you. You know, there's so many, we, we talked about making applications in, to, that apply to the whole church. It's hard to change a local church. It's hard to change the Catholic church, the universal church. It is hard to change it. But you can be changed. And when you are transformed as a person, you can impact a community. Remember those heretics, the pictures that we had, Jim Jones, Joseph Smith, David Koresh, all that kind of business. Those people were heretics who had a negative impact on a community. You can be a fully functioning, sound doctrine believing member of God's family having a good impact on your community. Helping other people to be transformed. It is on you. I love chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Salt and light as well. Yes. We have to be salt and light. And so that others can become salt and light. It can't just end with you in this class. You realize that a community of transformed persons can transform the world. It starts, though, with a transformed person that has an impact on a community that has an impact on the world. It's good stuff. But you've got to... You can't just satisfy your curiosity and answer all your questions and make your observations, you have to apply it. You have to let God's Word transform you. And finally, the last slide. 2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the Word of Truth. Lord willing, we've taken you, or I've taken you through this process. And I truly hope that you will take it to heart. I truly hope that you'll, you'll join us next semester as well. Um, any questions? Thank you.